Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, a podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm an investigative journalist and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are economists, scientists, politicians, academics and journalists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic and ecological crises that we face today. And they reveal their solutions to mitigate the damage to our future. This is a critical time for our planet, and it demands critical thinking. Go to planetcritical.com to learn more and subscribe. On today's show is academic and well-known speaker Nate Hagens. Nate is a fellow at the Post Carbon Institute, and he's also a member of the Resilience Project. What Nate is particularly known for is his big picture thinking. He synthesizes everything that's kind of going on in the world, And rather than providing solutions that are industry specific or problem specific, even he looks at how we can upgrade and evolve systems to create changes across industries and across the wider problem. What was really interesting about speaking with Nate is that a lot of his work is now focused around the need, he says, for humankind to upgrade its value system that the things that are meaningful to us, such as relationships, nature, community, become important to us. They become things that we value, we care for, and we prioritize. He thinks restructuring our value system is genuinely one of the ways that we can approach the climate crisis, the energy crisis, and the economic crisis, and actually find solutions. This is long-term and abstract thinking that doesn't often make it into the debate. So I really hope you enjoy listening to Nate and get a lot out of what he has to say. Thank you very much for joining me on the show. It's a pleasure to have you. Great to be here, Rachel. You are a name that has come up loads uh, with the people I've been interviewing, sort of your colleagues, maybe not in the same university, but in the same field. Um, So it's very exciting to have you on. And I did try and prepare as extensively as I could with the materials that you sent. But just give people a bit of background as to your career so they can know what to expect. Um, well, you had like 10 days to prepare and it's taken me 20 years to put together this, this synthesis. Uh, but my background is I started, uh, in college wanting to make money and, uh, get a better apartment, better car, all that stuff. So I went into finance Mm. and I ended up, uh, getting a master's in finance and working on wall street and started uh, managing money for rich people and started trading oil for one of them. And then I was reading about oil and the fact that it's finite and it's so powerful and we don't pay for the externalities. And over a couple of years, I started spending more and more time reading about the human predicament. Uh, And I spent so much time that I wasn't enjoying or focusing on my regular job, which is to manage money for rich people. And, uh, eventually came across some books by ecological economists. Um, I gave my clients their money back. I took a backpack full of ecology, neuroscience systems, books, and a golden retriever and hiked around North America for a year. And then I decided if I'm going to learn this much full time, I might as well get a PhD. (laughs) So I went back to school to study ecological economics. And that was in 2005. And since then I've been connecting with, um, systems experts in neuroscience, energy, financial systems, uh, climate change, biodiversity, um, evolutionary biology, et cetera, trying to create a cohesive picture of the challenges humans face because we live as part of a system and everything is connected. And there are so many experts out there on one or two issues. And I'm not really an expert in any one issue, but I'm trying to be a competent generalist on looking on how everything fits together because it does. What I find really interesting about that, and it's just an aside, is that you can see in the liberal arts, the academy has kind of gone towards what it calls intersectionalism. And it looks like science is, or at least some people in science are trying to do exactly that because it baffles me to think that um, there are different schools and all the economists just speak with each other and all the biologists just speak with each other and nobody, you know, 
crosses the line to say, hey, what, what data do you have? This is what we've got. We live in a sea of islands of expertise separated by oceans of nonsense. And those people don't talk to each other. So we need the experts, but we need to have a map created by the generalists first. So then the experts can apply looking at the right road in front of us. Because a lot of the roads that we expect, you know, colonizing Mars or economic growth for centuries, those just aren't going to happen. So what are you actually working on then? Specifically, I'm creating a uh, eight to 10 hour video course of my college uh, seminar called Reality 101, a survey of the human predicament and a podcast called The Great Simplification, uh, educational materials, especially for young people. And that's kind of the cultural change in awareness, uh, knowledge, and consciousness. And on the other end, I'm trying to influence politicians, policymakers, decision makers, especially former politicians, uh, under the concept of advanced policy, um, because knowledge of our predicament, knowledge of, um, human behavior, knowledge of our kicking the cans repeatedly to avoid facing what we need to face suggests that there is no way we can collectively vote on what needs to happen now. Our citizens and our politicians can't do the things that are going to need to be done in the next decade. So I've coined this phrase, advanced policy, which is preparing, uh, blueprints, break glass in case of emergency plans for the things we're going to need in the next decade that are not socially or politically acceptable now. So I'm also working on that. So just, just to clarify for listeners, then you are working essentially on how to navigate the, uh, climate crisis. Uh, the energy crisis, the economic crisis, and their intersection. It's all connected. Yeah. Um, we are a social species that has based our culture on extraction, mining, and consumption of ancient sunlight, which is, means that our economy, because of the benefits from fossil carbon, is over a thousand times bigger than it was 500 years ago, measured by number of people times average consumption. And we, just like organisms and ecosystems in nature, have a metabolism as a global culture. And so the climate crisis is not separate from those other things you mentioned. We basically have ecological overshoot as a species who's accessed this bolus of fossil carbon. And there are two giant categories of environmental impact. One is strictly from the size and scale of our metabolism. And that would be climate change, ocean acidification, anything to do with accumulating of waste products in, in the, the atmosphere, the biosphere. The other is all the things that we do with the energy, like elephant ivory and uh, overfishing the oceans and chopping down forests to build shopping centers. Those things aren't directly a product of our metabolism. Those are things that our culture chooses or at least accepts to do. Um, so yes, everything is linked. And what my thesis is that we will not stop. We will not vote to keep carbon in the ground. We will not choose to degrow. Look at what just happened, uh, in your country mm. <laughs> last week with Xi Jinping and, and the leader from India, uh, you know, changing the language on coal, uh, it's not going to be a phase out. It's going to be a minimization because we need this access to carbon energy, which is unbelievably powerful in what it does for us relative to historic generations. Um, so I think we're going to continue to have to maintain the financial system by growing our economy so that we can repay prior financial debts. To do that, we need this access to this high quality energy, coal, oil, and natural gas. And we will continue to do that and paper over our 
our um, debts with more and more central bank printing and government borrowing until we can't. And the until we can't point happens this decade, I think. And we're going to have what I refer to as a great simplification, which is our economies are going to get smaller and less complex and more localized. And that is not the emotional signal that we're getting right now because stock markets are at all time highs and, um, we're focused on other worries, but, uh, there is a big economic simplification on the horizon, which in some ways could be very good news for climate change, uh, as long as it's managed properly. Okay. That was a mouthful. That was a mouthful. Yeah. yeah. Let's, let's, let's get into it. Um, there's one thing I want to add before we get into it though, is that, um, India is definitely taking the fall for what happened at COP, but actually it was because the USA refused to include language about phasing out equitably um, because obviously the impact is different on different countries. So it was because the USA refused that uh, um, adjustment to the language that India then refused uh, phase out entirely because they're so much more dependent on that power. I'm, I'm sure you can show a graph of where the CO2 parts per million were at every convening of parties for the last 20 years from Kyoto mm. on, those conferences have done nothing to change the, the graph of our energy consumption or our CO2 emissions. That's not true. Um, before Paris, we were headed for four degrees warming. And now if we continue, we're headed for 2.4. Well, that's a mathematical interpretation of the model. I'm talking about the CO2 emissions in the atmosphere. The, the line is almost 100% correlated with our GDP from the 60s. So let's talk about that. Talk, um, because when I was researching, um, in a lot of your research, you have these really, really interesting statistics that I have never heard before, like, uh, the relationship between, um, energy and GDP that the global human economy uses energy at the size of GDP to the power of three quarters in seven days. Right. Well, there's a couple <laughs> things there. So there's something in nature called Kleber's law which is a biological uh, metabolism scaling law that happens with insects or mice all the way up to elephants or blue whales. And that shows that a, an organism will use energy, uh, its metabolism to the two thirds power of its size. And that actually also applies to the global human economy where the amount of energy we use is to the size of GDP as a, as a global culture to the three quarters power plus or minus some countries like the UK and the U S use less energy than that because we input, um, uh, we import a lot of our energy in the form of finished products that were made in China or, or elsewhere. So our, our energy footprint is in a different country, but if measured globally, GDP or globally would be GWP gross world product mm. can never decouple from energy because it basically is a measure of energy. Now we can decouple our happiness, uh, our well-being from energy, but right now the global goal of institutions and governments is to grow profits aggregated as GDP, globally aggregated as GWP. And GWP might as well be GWB, where the B stands for burning, because it's all a measure of our metabolism. Right now, humans in aggregate have a 17 terawatt uh, ongoing continuous metabolism that works out to 170 billion 100 watt light bulbs turned on all the time, 24 seven. So if you think about it, a human being, you or I walking around all day long, emit the, the continuous power the energy of one 100 watt light bulb. So that's about the, the natural individual endosomatic, meaning in the body metabolism for humans. So the average American uses a hundred of those hundred watt light bulbs in the form of our cars, our airplanes, our libraries, our football stadiums, our shopping centers, etc. So we use about a hundred times more than our bodies need. Europe is around 50 times as much as the bodies need. 
the United States, where I live, is around uh, four to five times the global average. Wow. As you point out, um, a lot of countries are not to blame for climate change, and they're bearing the brunt of, of the early impacts of climate. So, I mean, would one solution um, be for places like the U.S. and Europe who use so much more energy per capita? To, to decrease, would that give us another decade to try and figure out globally what was happening? I think we know what's happening globally. There is zero chance the U.S. is going to voluntarily decrease. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's what the, the point is, that there is an inertia to the system politically, economically, energetically, that we won't stop. We, there is no way that we can say, you know what, let's use less energy because every single good and service in the economy requires energy to mine, create, deliver, maintain, dispose of. So we have a monetary economy, but it's really an energy and materials economy. So we also create money um, without any relationship to natural capital, including energy. Money is created, 95% of it, from commercial banks when they make a loan. But what's not created is the interest. So our entire financial system and our representations of our physical reality in stocks, bonds, mortgages, um, checking accounts, savings accounts, all that has an imperative to grow. And so you can't just tell a country or a state or a community to stop growing. Uh, there's an inertia to the system. So that's what I meant before that we will continue to kick cans in any way we can until we can't. And I, I, our research shows that that moment is coming soon because the developed world um, keeps printing money and central banks keep bailing out uh, temporary too big to fail guarantees that have been going on since 2008, they're still in existence. So they're no longer temporary, they're, they're permanent. So the financial system is very much, um, in a, uh, no way out situation. They should be raising interest rates right now to slow the system because we're starting to have inflation, look mm -hmm. at the energy prices and the supply chains mm -hmm. and things. But we can't do that because that would um, shock the stock market. Uh, so we're, we're kind of in this, you know, uh, gauntlet where there are no good options. And I don't know how that's all going to play out. But I do think that we have a cultural bill due that's two generations in the making. And that there is a... 30% drop in global GDP coming this decade. And that's what I'm ultimately trying to work towards to prepare societies, not only to, to make it through that event, um, but to use that event to change our cultural objectives away from how much money we spend and how much energy we burn as a measure of our success towards something like valuing the earth that we share 10 million uh, with 10 million other species, the ecosystems, the, the fact that if I ask you, Rachel, what are the 10 best experiences of your life? And you really thought about it. Very few of them would have had to do with burning a lot of energy yeah. or using a lot of money on something. They would have been in nature or with friends or family or loved ones. And so we are kind of culturally caught like the the metaphor of the the monkey with his hand in a jar grabbing a banana a monkey trap the banana is gdp as a cultural goal all we have to do is change our cultural goal towards well-being or something else but we keep grasping on the banana harder and harder and we can't get our hand out of the jar um so I don't know if that all made sense. Yeah, it, it absolutely did. It, it absolutely did. Um, certainly because, like I said, I've, I've looked into your work. Um, but I think we might want to continue breaking it down into smaller segments for anybody that's sort of discovering this for the first time. Well, here, here are the things that are not widely known, but anyone listening to your show could quickly find them out on the internet with their own research. 
So I think there's a naivete in the climate movement. And by the way, my, my core goals, um, whether I'm alive or after I'm gone, uh, it's irrelevant. What I care about the most is the natural world and propelling species ecosystems through the bottlenecks coming in the 21st century. So everything I'm doing is, is based on that. So having said that, I don't think we can directly solve for climate because climate is a symptom, not the problem. It's a symptom of a much larger dysfunction, mm -hmm. which is ecological overshoot. So one thing that the climate community uh, generally doesn't understand, and nor does our culture, is that one barrel of oil, which we don't pay for the creation of, nor the pollution of, we just pay for how much it takes, costs us to extract it from the earth, which is maybe $50 or $60 to extract it right now. And the price is $70. One barrel of oil has 5.7 million BTUs worth of energy in it, which translated to work potential is 1,750 kilowatt hours of work in one barrel of oil. The average human does around six tenths of a watt per day in a nine okay. hour work day. So, so one barrel of oil does around five years of our work and we're paying 50, 60, $70 for it. One barrel of oil equates to five years worth of work of one human being. Yes. And the global economic system in 2021 pulls out from the earth 100 billion barrel of oil equivalents of oil and then coal and gas, which if you add them all together, it's 100 billion barrels worth. Multiply that times five years per yeah. barrel worth of human work. Every year, our economic system is subsidized by 500 billion fossil workers relative to 5 billion real human workers. So what this did when we access the carbon pulse, which is this one-time bolus of fossil sunlight that we're pulling out of the ground 10 million times faster than it was sequestered, what we're doing by accessing that is we're massively raising the wages for billions of people. Mm. Billions of people more came into existence and billions more came out of poverty. This is the result of us accessing this incredibly powerful, dense fossil carbon. So we can't just say, oh, let's switch to renewables and leave the bad energy in the ground. Renewables is another story. And first of all, they're not renewable. Uh, a chicken is renewable. A uh, oak tree is renewable as long as you have another chicken and an acorn. Solar pow power wind turbines are rebuildable. We need to use complicated machinery and polysilicone manufacturing and H rebar and lots of cement. These things can be repeated every 20 years or so. So these things are better called rebuildable technology that access renewable flows of the sun. Mm. But all of our solar wind, um, which are growing very rapidly globally right now, they're not reducing the amount of fossil fuels that we're using. So the global amount in 2019 of uh, the demand increase of electricity globally from 2018 to 2019, just the amount of electricity increase alone in one year was more than all of the solar power ever installed since the beginning of time. But I mean, so solar and wind are adding to the metabolism of the global superorganism. But that fits in with your theory about uh, energy always being tied to uh, economic growth, right? Yes. Now, that doesn't mean we can't use solar and wind. Mm -hmm. um, we should use them to uh, uh, construct a different society that's not quite as large and complex as the one we have. But to, to assume that we're just going to replace coal, oil, and natural gas with renewables and continue to consume anywhere near a 17 terawatt economy is, is naive. So energy consumption absolutely has to decrease. 
And in fact, it's going to no matter what, because we already hit peak oil, right? Are you basing that on watching my video or is that your own independent uh, conclusion? Uh, that's from talking with Dr. Kerry King. Ah, yeah. Okay. Um, that's a really complicated subject. I mean, of course, it, it shouldn't be controversial because oil is finite and we're pulling it out, you know, millions of times faster than it was created. Oil is mostly um, diatoms and uh, ancient algae that died uh, in the ocean mm -hmm. and was sequestered under heat and pressure and now we're, we're pulling it out. So obviously there's a pool of available oil on the earth and it will at some point peak and decline by definition. Over a hundred countries have already peaked and declined. Mexico is a prime example where their huge uh, field Cantarell is in massive decline. Um, the United States, well, the North Sea, where you, near where you live, that peaked 20 years ago and has been in sharp decline. Oh yeah, they ran out. So <laughs> I actually am of the opinion, I agree with Kerry, that, that globally oil peaked in 2018, but that gives the uh, insinuation that uh, you know, it's going down forever and we don't have enough. Um, we don't have enough, we have plenty and probably climate, uh, uh analysts would say we have too much, um, mm. to do lots of things. We just don't have enough to extract and produce a hundred million barrels a day for much longer. And what ends up happening is the decline rates, um, keep accelerating because we found the best first. So in the United States, for example, most of the increase in global production from 2005 to 2020 was from the United States. And that's because we access what's called uh, light tight oil or shale oil. And shale oil is the end. There's no sort of oil after shale oil. Um, it's the source rock where the other oil, uh, migrated from the, the, the better stuff that we used 20 or 30 years ago. The problem with shale oil, not to mention the fracking and the chemical pollutants and the climate impact, but the problem is that it depletes very rapidly. So mm. over half of United States oil right now is shale oil. And if we were to stop drilling, if for whatever reason, an environmental reason, a financial reason, or, or whatever, our oil production would decline by 40% in the first year, another 40% in the next year. We have to keep drilling and keep financing drilling in order to kind of maintain production where we are now, because the decline rate is so fast. Now, globally, the decline rate is, is much less than that, but it's still 5 or 6% that we have to offset, which is why the International Energy Agency, which is run by basically a, a climate activist, Fatih Biral, is basically saying that if we don't continue to invest in upstream oil uh, uh, capacity, we are going to have a massive energy crisis in the next decade because um, we... Uh, can't offset this decline unless we're financing new production. So that explains why Biden is selling off that massive oil thing. I can't remember off the top of my head what it all is, but it's one of the biggest new fields or whatever in the U.S. It explains why he's doing that the week after COP. I feel so badly for these politicians. I know that Obama, um, I used this in a presentation six or seven years ago. I forgot the exact details, but in the same week, uh, in 2014, Obama went and talked to a climate convention that we have to get off of fossil fuels. And then two days later, he went to a natural gas drillers association and said, energy is the future independence for America. We can't do both. Yeah. Um, unless. Oh, hang on. There's an unless. Well, the unless is the hope. The unless is that we eventually construct a society that's not based on counting how much energy we burn as our success. You mean when we move and away we from And we change GDP. it to human well-being and, and other things like that. But we're not going to vote to do that ahead of time because it's such a complex system. This will sound like fake news to most people. So we're going to have to make plans ahead of time when there's going to be these, these bumps in the road and have... Um, 
you know, a, a plans built out on how this might unfold and real life examples of communities doing things differently, the left and the right talking to each other, working yeah. on local projects because they care about them, but we're kind of sleepwalking into disaster. One statistic I wanted to bring up that I found absolutely fascinating was that um, because of this coupling of uh, energy and GDP, um, all world economies are, all major world economies are trying to grow by 3% every year, uh, which means that they will double every 25 years, which means our energy consumption is going to double every 25 yes. years. Yes. So think about this. So first of all, let me caveat that a, a little bit. Um, so there's a rule of 70, which is if you take the number 70 and divide it by a growth rate, that's how many years it will take something to double. So if something grows at 7% a year, it'll double in 10 years. If something grows at 2% a year, it'll double in 35 years. So if something's double uh, growing at 3% a year, it will double in around 24 years. But Energy and GDP aren't a hundred percent linked. They're 99 point something, which means that over time, human. And so, can I just interrupt? Sorry, but like, how, how do you calculate that? Calculate what? The, co the, the coupling, the correlation. Well, the simple answer is that energy and GDP are incredibly linked. That's the simple answer. The complex answer is, is more nuanced because humans do, um, use resources more efficiently and we come up with innovations and over time we do, uh, use less energy per unit of GDP, but it's very, very tiny from mm. 1970 to 2000. Um, we started to, uh, stop using oil in power plants and replace it with coal and, um, natural gas. And we also got them a lot more efficient on how we use coal. So for every unit of GDP or output, we were using less energy than we had been before. But if you look at that period, we got like 1% better every year. Mm -hmm. But the historical average since then has been about 0.5% better every year. What that means is if you have 100 new units of GDP, you're going to need 99.5 new units of, of energy. Gotcha. And you can just track this. Um, I have graphs that I could show you and, and on the material footprint, it's, it's almost one for one for every dollar of global GDP, we need two pounds of non-renewable resources like copper or sand or silicone or wood or, or things like that. That has oh been true God. from the seventies until today. Oh my God, that is terrifying. The average American born today will be expected to use 60 million pounds of materials during his or her lifetime. I'm understanding more and more why uh, Steve Keen says that it's neoliberal economists that are ruining our fight against climate change. Um, the people that insist upon growth. Economists are, are not bad people. I know a lot of them, but they've been following the wrong playbook because during yours and my lifetimes, Rachel, energy was always relatively cheap and almost always abundant. So we, ex back in the day, like, um, the early economists, Ricardo, uh, Adam Smith, they understood that our wealth and productivity was linked to land and the productivity from the land. But all of a sudden, when we started accessing this huge pool of coal, oil, and natural gas, and everyone was getting rich and uh, technology was expanding over time, we kind of neglected this biophysical input to our expl explanations of our wealth and everything became labor and capital. So all the economic textbooks today, even don't treat energy as special, even though one barrel of oil for $70 mm. does five years of my work. That is not in any economic textbook in the world because a dollar's worth of energy to an economist is worth a dollar's worth of pen or a dollar worth of coffee or a dollar worth of gummy bears, uh, because they're all worth the same, but energy is required for all those things. So yes, I, I think the, um, neoliberal 
economic, uh, shamans are, you know, that is a big barrier to, um, changing our cultural course. I, I can tell you in the last 15 years of the global heads of state and senators and, uh, you know, policymakers that I've met with, every one of them without question was flanked immediately by an MBA or, uh, an economics PhD that kind of ran interference on these sorts of discussions but because to an economist, what I'm saying is hearsay. First of all, if I'm right, then a lot of the work that they've done is undermined, you know, they'll lose status and, and everything. Um, but, but deeper than that, they truly believe that price signals, if something gets scarce, for instance, oil, the price will go so high that the market will come up with an alternative and the economy will continue to grow one way or the other, two to 3% into the future for centuries. Now it'll look different a couple centuries from now. We can't know how it's going to look, but humans will innovate and the market will solve it. And that ignores the fact that energy can only be substituted by other energy. There is no substitute for energy other than a different sort of energy. So getting to your question in a long-winded way, if we, all major governments, uh, world leaders, the default expectation is that we're going to grow at something like 3% a year into the future, because we have the last 50 years. So all the models show that we'll continue to grow. If we grow at 3% a year, we will double the amount of energy and materials that we've ever used for the last 10,000 years in the next 30 years. And then there will be another doubling the next 30 years. So if you're in high school right now, there will be two of these doublings in your lifetime if economists are right which means that the earth will use four times as much energy and materials as we do today. Um, is that possible? Is that desirable? What yeah. happens if that happens? What happens if that doesn't happen? Our research oh, says really? the next doubling is not going to happen. Um, well, yeah, if oil peaked in 2018, yeah. there's no way the next doubling happens. Because that is, oil is the, yeah. the hemoglobin of modern society. If you take an aerial view of London where you are, the brake lights and the headlights of the cars are very much like veins and arteries in our body transporting hemoglobin, but they're using oil to transport things around the global system. So as that energy surplus, so that's another core thing that a lot of people don't understand is that energy is the currency of life. And in nature, energy enables what an animal can and can't do. And if a cheetah is chasing a gazelle in Africa and he fails, he's used some energy and he tries again and he fails. He, he only, he eventually he catches a, a cheetah, I mean, a, a gazelle, and there's a huge energy payoff for that. The relationship between the energy expended by the cheetah and the energy received by the gazelle. That ratio of is, is called energy surplus and the energy surplus has been a driver of evolution and nature. And right now the energy surplus accessed by humans is 85% fossil. So we are substituting our technology and the resources we get from the hydrological cycles of the sun, um, by mm. fossils <laughs> that are finite. And we don't have a plan. The game is the plan. Because we're energy blind, we just assume that changing the prices and innovation will solve this problem. The only thing that will solve the problem is using less, considerably less. But the human behavior side of things is we're not going to choose to use less until we're forced to. So I'm predicting a great simplification for our societies in the next decade. But as individuals listening to this, if you follow along and believe it, um, you can simplify first and beat the rush. I mean, what are the things in life that bring you the most joy and peace and happiness and do those things really 
uh, um, need all the energy that has been so cheap that we uh, live like kings and queens of old metabolically as far as how much energy we use. So what would a 30% reduction in the economy look like for people? It depends where you live, but in the United States, that would bring us back to 1990s level GDP. A 50% reduction would bring us to 1970s level. And the UK is probably very similar. Um, and, th and this gets back to the distribution problem. Because in certain developing countries, a 30% drop would be catastrophic. So there has to be, um, we have plenty of energy. We're using it. We're basically wasting, um, this gift from the earth. Uh, even though I don't even like referring to this as fossil fuels, because that presumes that they were lying there underground for humans to use as fuel. The correct term is fossil hydrocarbons, which we're choosing to use as fuel. Um, but I, I think it, you know, it's a, in 1929, the United States, uh, economy went through a great depression also felt in other areas of the world. The peak to trough GDP drop was 29.6% during the early 1930s. And I think something like that is, is coming, uh, in the next decade because we don't see that. We don't feel that because we're papering over these problems with electronic digits and central bank guarantees so that it's, it's this anesthesia that is papering over the problems. So right now the global, uh, amount of debt that we have is approaching over 300% what our income is. So that would be the equivalent of you making 50,000 pounds a year, but borrowing 150,000 pounds. And every year you have to owe the bank more and more, um, because you can't live on your 50,000. So you have to borrow a little bit more. So eventually the interest that you owe becomes eats into your ability to pay for your normal things. So this is what we're doing as a global culture. The United Kingdom is doing it. The United States is doing it. Japan is doing it. China is doing it in a huge way. Europe is doing it. Um, and, and, and I think this is a, a musical chairs situation and the result is going to be a smaller economy. It's also going to be a smaller, uh, carbon output. Um, so that's why. I care most about climate change, but I think we have to hold society together in the coming decade, um, to protect the environment and to have educated systems wise people making good decisions, given what's coming in the future. I think some of the, and I'm, I'm sure if you've talked to Tim Garrett and other people on your program, um, many of the climate scenarios for the, the representative concentration pathway 8.5 showing that we're going to use 800%, uh, the carbon in the year 2100, as we did in 2010 are biophysically implausible. There's no, um, uh, geology or, or natural resource accounting that goes into that. It's just saying what sort of, uh, climate forcing um, would bring us to eight and a half Watts per square meter. Okay. Let's just figure out how much coal oil and natural gas we have to use. There was no like biophysical analysis of, is that actually possible? And it's, it's not having said that the climate doesn't stop in the year 2100. It continues to warm with all the, the carbon in the pipeline for centuries, the equilibrium, uh, earth system, um, sensitivity, I mean. We should not be just talking about 2100. We should be talking about long time frames. Mm. And even if the economy globally were to decline by 50% in the coming 10 or 20 years, there would still be a glide path to coal use for a very, very long time. Sorry. What do you mean a glide? There would be a glide path to coal use. Uh, that just means the, the human default, it's what, um, 
uh, Xi Jinping and, and India, they're, they're using more and more coal now. Um, because what's happening is natural gas is getting a lot more expensive. So we're switching back to coal mm. and as things get more expensive, we will go back to coal again, um, unless things change. And one of the things I'm working on, um, with people in the UK, actually at Imperial college is this concept of taxing, not only carbon, but all non-renewable resources. We have oh. an initiative called untax.org. And that would be a um, return to more accurate pricing of how goods and services are priced in our economy. We've underpaid for the main input to our economies, dramatically underpaid for a century. If I tell you that one barrel of oil does five years of my work, we're paying pennies on the dollar for that. Yeah. So if we change the prices, <clears throat> then we would change the incentives and people would innovate to develop technology that would be more appropriate for a resource, energy, and material constrained future. We would also conserve and maybe not fly to Vegas on the weekend or, um, you know, go to Europe for a, a, a mini trip on a, on a Ryanair trip. Um, because those things would get more expensive. We would take care of things more rather than buy them and buy a new one in two years. An iPhone might be three or $4,000 instead of $600. Um, so not everyone would have one maybe, and we would have to repair them and, and take care of them better. It wouldn't have to be a disaster, but I think that would give society better long-term pricing and incentives for innovation. It's, it's a very interesting concept. Um, I think my mind immediately goes again to the equity of it. So if you have a, a flat tax rate um, for non-renewable sources, then essentially you will have people that can afford it. You will have nations generally where their populations can afford it. And it will create a huge education discrepancy whereby people can afford to to buy their polluting emissions and and travel and go and learn about the world and have opportunities and experiences and others who are frankly most in that position anyway in today's world with so many living in poverty but it will become even harder to pull them out the only way this would work is if that was paired with some sort of a distribution or yeah. universal basic income sort of thing because you're absolutely right it would generally if it was just applied across the board, it would be regressive. So it would yeah. have to be paired with something like that. Absolutely. But if our energy is exponentially depleting, um, and there would be a 30% GDP shrink as well, how could we afford a universal basic income through using this, this tax? Well, at, at the very early stages, there would be probably more money available, um, because uh, of, of the way it would be set up, but you're right. If, if energy is declining over time, um, then the tax would be declining over time. Um, and we're, that's what Imperial college is doing right now is modeling how this all might actually work out. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, I don't have the answers, Rachel. I've been, unfortunately, um, working on this for 20 years. I know the problems quite well. And I know the ultimate answer is we're going to a physically have to use, consume less, not because we choose to, because we're going to have to, and B, we need a cultural change of consciousness, which comes from education and awareness and podcasts where we have to recognize our relationship with each other and with the planet and what is important because the two core pillars of meaning for our species have been religion and economic growth. Mm. Uh, and I think we need a, a new thing to believe in and look forward to culture wide. What I believe in is the sacredness of the treasure, which is the natural beauty and life and vibrancy of this earth and all the species and ecosystems we share. So it's kind of an animist religion, if you will, mm -hmm. um, protect the 
denizens of, of your place where you live. Um, the thing that I enjoy the most is in the morning I have coffee and I go and check my wildlife camera in the woods here mm -hmm. where I live and I get to see which kind of animals showed up in the night. And I just love it knowing that I share this place with those animals. The economic system attaches zero value to that, mm. except for the gun license to shoot a deer gets paid to the DNR or whatever. But mm. we need ultimately a gut check as a species. We are the first generation of homo sapiens to be able to figure out how this all fits together. And there's this issue of the superorganism which is a little frightening because it makes an individual person feel like they don't have agency. And that's partially true. There's something called downward causation, which is you referenced early, the neoliberal market policies are forcing downward, um, things that we have to navigate in our own life, the prices and the yeah. economic aspirations, and we have to get jobs and all this stuff. So I, I don't think there's an easy answer, but I believe, and this is what I teach my students, the answer starts with personal um, recognition of this is the, the backdrop of my life and I want to make better decisions, not to save the planet, but to be more personally resilient for what's coming ahead and eventually build awareness and behavior change and pilots and movements and activism that align with this sort of future. The problem is with the stock markets at all time highs and Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos going to outer space, uh, as if it's like the new Disneyland, we're not getting the cultural signals of an earth trek future, yeah. which is going to be our reality. And so that's why education. And that's why I, I do podcasts like this to get more people to think about it and play a role, um, uh, in their own communities, in their own lives, because I don't think, I, I think there's so many possible paths forward and the human brain doesn't like uncertainty. And so when you hear scary things, what ends up happening is you want to feel like, you know, what's going to happen. So your brain goes to two poles, one, the Star Trek future, Elon Musk, we're going to colonize outer space and everything's going to be glory, full technology. And on the other side, it's Mad Max doom. There's nothing we can do. We're screwed. Um, might as well just, uh, have some martinis and watch some good Netflix. The truth and where we need more people to work towards is in the middle because both of those poles of fantasy and doom, uh, obviate the need for any personal responsibility or change because those things are hard. Um, so it's my hope, and it might be naive that more people kind of understanding this and changing the conversations with the people in their own community. And that's another thing I hope to do with this video series is share it with people in your own community, left, right, center, young, old, rich, poor, white, black. We need, a, a all hands on deck and people understanding what's coming. Uh, and I think about the best thing that we could do in our nation and your nation now is build social capital locally, build the networks of connection where, um, you might not agree with everything I'm saying. You might, uh, um, not understand all the energy and climate nuances, but if you build connections with other real humans, those are going to be beneficial no matter what happens in the future, because if you don't have those networked, uh, relationships locally, then Th then we're really, uh, in trouble. And that's a problem, uh, another problem, which we don't have time to discuss, but the social media algorithms are just hijacking us towards more and more polarization. That's their objective. The things that are mild and, uh, um, social network building are downvoted. The things that are polarizing and extreme are upvoted yeah. and get shared. Yeah. So the social media is making the problems that you and I are discussing worse. But this brings me back to a point because arguably then it's not really um, your average Joes and Janes in your local communities that need to make a change. It's the people that are impacting the downward causation 
that you know the only thing that trickles down in neoliberal politics like it's them that need to make changes and it's them that need to need to make policy changes because then the pe people will just adapt i mostly agree with you but in my experience those people are not going to change uh until they have to because they're think about if you're a politician and you just got elected and you meet uh rachel donald and nate Hagens that tell you what's happening do you think you're going to go out and tell your constituents that we're headed for a great simplification and we need to do X, Y, and Z? People don't like to hear we're going to have less. They do like to hear we're going to have different, and different could be better. Um, we might work less and have more free time, but we're not going to be able to afford all the things that we can afford. I'll just tell you from a strict human behavior standpoint, I've met with a lot of government leaders, and they're incapable of saying these things. I think uh, having a pint uh, or three, they can understand some of these things and agree, but vocally, they cannot say these things aloud. I mean, look at the, what just happened in Glasgow. How many of these core truths were spoken that we have to use mm. less? It's all okay. about, you know, redistributing and switching to renewables uh, net zero, um, they're just not, it's not the yeah. right conversation because the right conversation, which 20 years of my life force has been put into understanding this, is not a popular thing. Um, so I think we need both. We need to educate those people who will be in power when this happens so that they have plans and understand systems and ecology and the relationship between the energy, uh, uh, human economies, resources, and money. But we also need to, to, um, meet it halfway with people locally. And you're right. Most people kind of do just follow. So we, mm -hmm. we don't need climate change. We need systems change is, is kind of a, yeah. a, a, a trite expression, but ultimately that it, it's true. We're going to need a, a different system, but we're not going to choose the system voluntarily. It's going to, be, it's going to, we're going to react to it. So everything that I'm working on is to try to change the initial conditions in people's hearts and minds of that moment. All right. Well, thank you for the work that you do. Neat. Who would you like to platform? There's a huge list of people in the field of ecological economics, uh, biophysical economics that have been working on these things for a very long time. Um, Bill Reese, Hannes Kuntz, Herman Daly, Josh Farley. Josh was my PhD advisor and he's a real lovable, gregarious, uh, brilliant guy. That would probably be who I would suggest to you next. Um, you know, I, I think there's all kinds of experts out there on, on various aspects, but I think it's the, the linkage between the energy and the economy, uh, is a core thing for people to understand because our culture is energy blind. So I'll, I'll come up with some names for you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time, Nate. You're welcome, Rachel. If you want to learn more about Nate's work, I'll put links to some of his profiles over on planetcritical.com, where you can choose a paid subscription to support this podcast. Thank you for listening and for your support. See you next week.